The Life After podcast is now coming at you every other Thursday. And to celebrate, I am having a giveaway. If you could list all of the evangelical references in a new Patreon commercial, you could win. To enter, find the post on social media or thelifeafter.org. The winner will be drawn on September 30th and will receive a shirt and tote bag from the new Life After merch on tpublic.com. Finally, find the Life After on Facebook to learn about the secret community because you don't want to deconstruct alone. This is Brady Harden. I'm glad you're joining me today, and I hope that you enjoy this episode of The Life After. Deconstructing your faith and your beliefs, everything, oh my God, it is confusing as hell, especially if you're like me and you grew up in it, and the fundamentalism where it had everything combined with this big all or nothing exclusive package it is insane to try to figure out how does this stuff add up because you have to go in you have to take pieces apart that when it was given to us it was never presented as something that could be taken apart and now we're in real life and we can take ideas from books uh, more uh, as a la carte from a huge library of books instead of just one. Deconstruction opened that up, but it is still confusing as hell. A big question too is what do we do with with God? I remember as I was deconstructing, I went from so many different types of God because I wanted to figure out which one actually gives to the expectations or which one lines up to the expectations that I'm reading from the book that told me about him in the first place. And I never was able to quite experience that. And it created a lot of frustration for me, especially when I started to get online uh, after making a podcast and interacting with other people online about deconstruction, et cetera. I remember seeing somebody making fun of fundamentalist for taking the Bible literally. Oh, and as somebody who had left the faith at that point, it still burnt me inside because that's the reason I had repressed myself was to honor this, this God and, and to do it in the way that I best knew. And if he wasn't able to circle back around and correct that for me, I don't really think that that trauma is that funny. So it's like there was this misunderstanding of why people do what they do. It, it isn't to get away with hatred or whatever. It's because they feel like they're doing what is right and their ideas of values and morals have been tied up in this other thing. So what about you? What has your deconstruction been like? Have there been parts that you're able to keep and that you value? And have there been parts that you're realizing may not be the most helpful for you? Because every deconstruction is completely different, and I, and I want to respect that, I do recognize that there is a lack of resources for people who may not go into the mainstream progressive Christianity or may not go into the mainstream atheism, or they may be somewhere in the middle. And that's what this episode is here for. When leaving fundamentalism, we're not just lacking religion. We could also be lacking understanding storytelling, you're understanding how to use the terminology God. Those sort of bigger changes during our deconstruction can take us outside of the Christian narrative completely. Recently, I asked people in the life after, if you could tell one or two sentences to yourself when you started to deconstruct, what would you say? One person's answer has been sticking with me for days, and it was Elizabeth. She said, the game changer for me was when somebody still in the ministry said, if there's too much baggage attached to Christianity for you, it's okay. You can leave. That person was able to put the person first and the religious branding second. And it was hard for me to kind of find people who I felt were really practicing that when interacting with people online in the deconstruction spaces, et cetera. And I found that in a friend that I made online named Sherry. I'm going to share my conversation with her here in a minute. But the thing about her that really clicked was when she talked about God, she put him in quotations. 
And in that way, it allowed her and I to talk about the same human experiences and values, but do it in a way that crossed the language barrier of me as somebody who doesn't use God language or belief anymore. I identify as a secular humanist, and her is somebody who sees God in a way that is different than what I grew up with. You may be in a different part in your deconstruction. Parts of this conversation may be helpful and other parts may be not. A la carte it. <laughs> and I take what is helpful and leave what is not. We'll be right back with my conversation with Sherry after this. They say the nostalgia is a really powerful force. And now that I'm producing the Life After podcast on my own, I could use all of the help that I can get. So I went back to the drawing board and updated the show's Patreon program so I can keep the candle burning. On the Life Afters page on Patreon.com, you'll find several monthly contribution tiers you can choose from. Each includes digital rewards like infographics inspired by episodes, videos, sound bites, and each tier includes its own merch like stickers, mugs, posters, plus one tote bag. Find the Life After on Patreon today. You don't want to be left behind, or even left behind teen series. And keep in mind, the Life After. Find the Life After on Patreon.com, and let's party like it's WoW 1999. Sherry, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I am well. Thanks for having me. Um, where are you from? Where are you calling from? I am in Florida now, originally from California, Bay Area. Bay Area. Okay. Now, I know a funny little factoid about you growing up. Uh, oh, God. You've shared with me. Oh, no, no, no. You've shared it with me, so it can't <laughs> be too bad, I'm hoping. But I'm assuming this was when you were in the Bay Area. You were on a television show? As a I was on a game show, yes. Oh, my God. Tell me about that. It was called Starcade. Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, I still get fan mail, which I sent you last week. When <laughs> I was 12. Uh, so it was a really long time ago, uh, but it, we played video games. That was the game show. It was questions and answers and playing video games to get uh, the highest score and win your own arcade game. Wow, you were like a, a star in the breaking. That is that's amazing. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, it's, you know, it's my claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> and I came across you because of your um, online presence in the deconstruction community, which has been such a weird thing for me to navigate and to understand as somebody who has like a degree in biblical studies and theology. And, you know, I hit a couple stages of Christianity on the way out. And so I have like this history and then coming onto the deconstruction world where um, I'm, I'm like, I just want people to be good. And then there's, or well, and then there's always, well, what about God? What about God? And you're one of the few people that I feel like I've interacted with. And we kind of like see eye to eye, even though we may not use the same terminology. Um, so how did you get to that point um, with your Christian upbringing? Did you grow up in it at first? I was saved at six. Um, my mom, we were assemblies of God, which was pretty vanilla at that point, but, uh, she moved into a more of an evangelical, um, tone later in my teenage years. Um, I was rejected. I was abandoned uh, all because of her beliefs. So when I found out that the Bible was neither consistent nor inerrant, Um, I lost my faith in all of my beliefs. It was a huge um, cognitive dissonance for many years. And I really, 
I, I didn't want anything to do with the God that was portrayed in my mom and what I saw in others. So I completely rejected that version and, and said so to her. So, you know, if this is, if your God tells you to disown your child, I want nothing to do with your God. He's an asshole. So I went on this basically a 25 year mission of trying to figure out if there was any truth to any of my beliefs. And I went through lots of ebbs and flows, um, some going full, there's nothing to, there's still something. And I grew up in the evangelical church as a school also. So science wasn't something that I was legitimately taught. You know, it was literally four paragraphs that were my evolution um, <laughs> schooling. So I knew nothing. I, I, wow. I, I always think of the, the, the phrase at home. You know, it's kind of like an internet meme where it's like, oh, we've got food at home or like a Taco Bell at home. And then it's just a picture of like a really crappy at home made taco. I feel <laughs> like that's what science at church, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I, and I, I saw this documentary in the middle of the night that talked about evolution. It was narrated by Tom Selleck. And I had never, I know, random, right? I'm flipping through the stations and I was tired. So I was like, okay, this guy's going to put me to sleep and let me hear about something I've never learned before. And I about fell off the couch. I was like, oh my God, this totally makes sense. And it started filling in a lot of the gaps and questions that I had. Um, and ironically, uh, science is what brought me back to believing in a higher power, I will say. And that uh, it, it's, I can literally say that's pun intended because I believe that God is an energy. I do not believe because of science, um, everything that is matter decays and dies, that energy doesn't. So in coming through all of this and trying to navigate everything, I came to the conclusion that what we call God, what religion has called God all of this time is really the miraculous energy of love. What gives you butterflies in your stomach, which makes you want to do nice things. I no longer believe in the God of religion. I don't believe that there is some dude in the sky who's, who's watching everything I do and giving me parking spaces, but letting children die. I believe that what we are supposed to do is bring, quote, God into our lives, which means we are to love. And in acting out that love is how we bring, quote, God into our lives. There's no, you know, he's not up there going, well, let's do this and let's do that. It's a flow. It's an energy. And it's the energy, the creative of love. Something that kind of is shared between humans from one exactly. to another. I really like that. I think a lot about what I consider the difference between religion and spirituality. I have a lot of friends that I was deconstructing. They had belief systems that were different than mine, like a witchcraft or whatever. But as I listened to what they said, there was nothing at all that made me uncomfortable or was any red flag to me at all, even as a spiritual abuse victim. Mm -hmm. And I had to really kind of put my feelers out of what, what is the difference? What is it that makes this uh, supernatural story or supernatural belief different than how I look at this one? And for me, it, it, it had to do with where does the energy come from and where does it go? If it stays from humans to humans, then it's like a spirituality that I feel benefits us as, as a humanist. But then whenever it's us giving up our autonomy or giving up our dedication freely um, as a species up to or appropriating it up to an idea, then it's like, why are we giving that up? And people get hurt from that. Well, it, I I, th I love the way you put that, but I think it's more than giving up. It's giving blame, right? So he, mm. one of the things that I say I, I love is the word onus because it's literally on us. Mm. 
And so we are to bring the love here. If there is a child in the hospital that has cancer and is dying, we should not be praying for salvation or a miraculous. We should be there at the hospital, giving that child love, comforting them. When you take these beans, these beans of matter, um, you take all the responsibility off of yourself. You blame the devil. You have everything to look forward to or, or fear in the future, and nothing is in the present. There's nothing, you know, reflecting in your actions today. There is not, you know, if you lose your focus of your fellow man, then it is a religion, and then it is divisive and separative, and all of those things that religion totally does. Hmm. That's really interesting. I'm, I'm curious. As, as somebody who deconstructed, uh, I'm not going to say long ago, but de- <laughs> uh, deconstruction legacy uh, okay. is the term we use, right? Uh, what was that culture like? Was there any other people that you were deconstructing with at that time? Oh, no. Or was this kind of, you were on your own and had to figure it out? I was totally on my own and had to figure it out. And I did so through writing. And, you know, having a mission, the, the church, uh, when my grandson was born, his mother came to me and said that he, that she wanted to have him christened and asked if I could help. And I said, no, um, I don't know anything about the Catholic church. I'm fully Protestant. I don't know anything about christening. There's a church around the corner. I can make some calls, but I don't know anything about this. We do dedications. That's, that's how my son was done. So she said, okay, that's what I want to do. So I contacted the church that my son went to. Um, I had gone a few times and had really bad experiences, very judgmental people, very cliquish, but he loved it. So I contacted them and they proceeded to tell me that they refused to do a dedication for my grandson because his parents weren't married and he was conceived in sin. And I about lost my shit. Um, I sent them a letter using all of the information and ammo I had from Christian schools and churches and to send their their words back to them and say, Jesus didn't ask, you know, who was righteous and who was worthy when he called for the children. This, you know, may your, the, the, the veils of the church will come clashing down again and all of this, you know, really. And she called me the next day and said, okay, well, we've reconsidered. Uh, We'll do it after service on a Wednesday, but not in front of anybody. Okay. (laughs) Yeah, that didn't go over well at all. And I... What is the rationale there that doesn't... It was... He was conceived in sin and he was... And because they were Mm. still not married... um, I mean, haven't they they seen Hunchback and Notre Dame? Like that's a blessing. That's all this was supposed to be was a prayer. Right, right. And and they refused based on their high horse, and you know, and so that really ignited me. So I I've been on a mission since. Uh, He's eleven now, and I have written a book, and that uh, you know, it's it got me through. It was very therapeutic, and it also focused my deconstruction to find the truth. I love that. I relate to your story. I hear you so much empowered by, or or driven by making sure people aren't pushed out of the way. And I I think that that's so important when it comes to religion. It's funny because there are times, uh, Sherry, and you would laugh at this because you know me and that I'm very humanist and uh, that religion makes me uncomfortable in a lot of ways, but like I relate with Jesus at times because um, I think of him as somebody who was raised up into a fundamentalism, him as a, as a character, right? Yes. Raised up in a fundamentalism. Um, There's this theory that I heard that he ran off into Asia and and was able to learn some Eastern religion and he came yeah. back and so he brought like this new more openness spiritual idea to fundamentalism and the way that we have the story and the it, who I if there was a, a uh, historical Jesus that looks anything like this books or not um, yeah. it was probably a, 
egomaniac or cult leader or something, but um, that's how he's presented. But whenever he came back and had like these other ideas of treating others the way that you want to be treated um, and these kind of more Eastern thought, then it just blew up that, that, that world and that environment. And so when people say that they are uh, trying to be a Jesus or trying to bring to me, what that would mean is that they're, they're going into these belief systems, breaking up the biases and making sure that it's about people again. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what I see in, in you and in your work is that the one version in my mind of Jesus that makes sense. Um, I see that as a, as a goal in what you do. And I love that. I, that's why I'm a, that's why we connect is because I have been somebody who's been pushed out. And so I relate to you and how you care and how you think. Thank you. Um, I know, I no longer believe Jesus was divine. I do. I think that every human that has ever walked this planet is flawed so that we must look at that at with that discernment. So I still, I, I say to my um, friend, Christian friends who freak out, you know, when I say, I don't believe Jesus is divine, but I still think of him as my main guy. And I do that because I like the um, example he set. I like the fact that he was taking on the establishment that was corrupt. I like the fact that he fought for the underdog. I like the fact that he said love. Don't worry about these laws because everything that he said is applicable today. You know, I mean, we are really in the same type of things with all of these fanatics and the fundamentalists and, and killing people and division and all of these things. So I use him as um, an example. With discernment, though, you know, there's some things that, that you know, like he told his mother to fuck off. Can I curse? As much as you want. As much <laughs> as you want. Um, he told his mom to fuck off, you know, basically in his family. Um, there were some things that I look at as the rest of the Bible where there'd be man's and political influence that was put in. So, uh, you know, I look at it through that lens to say, you know, the people who wrote this are flawed. The people who were there were flawed and that we must take the, you know, I love the saying, breathe in the good shit, breathe out the bullshit. And that's where we must really use our brains to say, look, I know it says in Deuteronomy to kill your disrespectful children, but you shouldn't do that. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. If, right, you know, right. if, if the Bible is telling you something that isn't unconditional love, forgiving your neighbor, doing disregard it. It's crap. Yeah. And that's really easy for me to do at this point. I don't know that it's easy for everybody because they still hold on to the full package. I've been yes. able to compartmentalize it and go, crap, crap, this is good. This will make me a better person. And if this quote, God, doesn't make me a better person, then it's completely worthless. That's such a good phrase. I think of fundamentalism and evangelicalism that I grew up as as a prepackaged, all or nothing. Mm -hmm. It's this brand. It's an exclusive brand. This is it. And that's how it's presented. And it's not just your values. It's, it's, it's all built into your values are built into your beliefs, are built into your history, like what you think is history. Um, built into how your community is built, your community rules, how you should behave. It's all built together and it's a all or nothing Jumanji set that once it's opened, there's no closing it until it's played its entire course. But isn't that a myth though? I mean, that's what, that's what they sell us, but they that's don't. They us, right? I mean, they, mm -hmm. they eat bacon, they eat shrimp, but then they'll say, you know, homosexuality is going to send you to hell. No, <laughs> it was far worse of a crime to eat shellfish and, you know, the, the um, hooved animals than it was for homosexuality. That was about uh, another, um, a pagan god. So it's very selective in their boxes. They That's pick and choose and what they want to say. And they say, take it all, but they don't. There's no consistency there whatsoever. It's yeah, you know, whatever is normalized by our culture, because 
the way that I look at it is when I was, you know, uh, living as a straight white man, you know, and I was open about my, my sexuality and my attraction, but I, you know, I was repress openly repressing it and, and I was married. And so I had these certain sort of privileges in my communities. And it wasn't until after I came out that I realized, oh shit, that's not the case. And it wasn't until I went through spiritual abuse that I realized, oh shit, that's not the case. It's when we rub against that conflict that we start to question. And when somebody's in a dominant culture and they're the ones who are in the in crowd and it fits for them, that friction isn't going to be there. So I think what we've done is we've normalized this culture that kind of becomes just as canonical as the Bible, but because we don't have anything to rub up against with a lot of certain parts of it, there's nothing that we really are becoming aware of that we should fix or change. There's no aspiration to the God of religion. <laughs> you know, he's judgmental, um, he's unforgiving, sends people to hell for eternity if he feels like it, likes these children, hates these children. I mean, the common woman is more holy and ethical than the God of religion. Preach. I mean, when I realized that I, as a mother, was more loving than this God that was regularly killing kids. I mean, all of the major stories in the Bible are about murder, killing children, Moses, even Jesus. Um, I wanted nothing to do with that. And I still don't. If, if it's not about making me a more, I mean, because better is so subjective, right? A lot of evangelicals are going to go, well, I'm better than you because. So I try to nix better from my vocabulary and really lay it out to be more loving. You know, what is more accepting? What is more loving? What is more compassionate? What is more kind? Um, being nice is fake. You know, being judgmental is is not in our highest interest. And if it doesn't make he life on earth here right now, a better place, I have no value for it. God, I love that. There's, it's been hard with the deconstruction world of kind of getting out of theology slash God talk or just even framing things through the storytelling lensing, lens of God yeah. and then coming back to it. One thing that you did that really built a bridge between myself as a secular humanist and you was you started to put quotations around the word God. Can you kind of give us a little bit of a teaser on why you did that? And when we get back uh, from the break after that, I want to dive in deeper of uh I, uh, this idea of God and, and what does it have to do now with somebody who's deconstructing and what does it mean for them in their past, et cetera. Uh, but first, do you mind explaining a little bit about why you started putting quotations around God at times? Well, when I started to find the ex-evangelical and deconstructing groups on social media, I had this whole thing of, well, I just, you know, got to set everybody straight. Here's my ego coming in and doing this. And I, and I realized pretty quickly that without the quotes, people brought all of their baggage onto that word. And I don't know that there is any word that has more baggage than God. So in talking to people on Twitter and social media and things like this, I really, because I, I never had a problem with God. I had a problem with his followers. I had a problem with his, um, you know, his PR firm. Your PR firm needs to go away. I mean, there is a reason that when people leave the ministry, they just end up in marketing. Like, oh, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I, I started adding quotes because what I was saying usually had nothing to do with a dogmatic religious God. It was more something, you know, in, in the love aspect, and this is what we need to focus on. And, and let me say that 
while I think I'm on the right path and I think that, you know, I would rather err on the side of love, you know, the, the cliche or saying that's out there. I have no way mastered this. I, you know, I know how difficult it is. I still get road rage. I still get really angry at people and I'm not this, you know, uh, passe uh, person to say, okay, um, you know, just walk all over me. If anything, I got more strength uh, from owning my life, from owning my own actions and not doing it to please anyone else. Let me rephrase that. Not doing it to, pre- to please some God or some organization, but to actually make life better for my common man. Awesome. Well, I cannot wait to continue this conversation. Um, we will be right back right after this. Okay, Chuck, are you ready? Have we only have one shot? We got to make this work. Uh, wait, you didn't give just just me just read your lines. I'll uh, give you the paper. Okay, okay. Psst, are you guys ready? Are you ready? Are you? All right. Uh, oh, uh, um, are you ready where, 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 to where, deconstruct where they, with friends? What the what the hell? Where did, where did all this come from? <laughs> deconstructing your faith it used you, to be you got a band? and boring wait, as hell. Wait, 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 but no one must wait. deconstruct their faith alone ever again when you um, deconstruct with friends. Um, Chuck, tell them what we mean. Um, yeah, Go. that's that's right, Brady. Yeah. Uh, the life after has a. Uh, I went full on Jumanji on this one. You keep going. He's a renter by the hour. The the Life After Podcast has a secret Facebook community and Slack channel for people deconstructing the the, uh, Christian fundamentalism and other oppressive religions. Uh, Meet new people and and, uh, and deconstruct with With friends. friends. (laughs) Nice job, Chuck. You even got the echo. Uh, Thanks. Uh, That was kind of cool, I guess. Oh, God, he's touching me with his trunk. Uh, you can apply for the secret group it's on, our fa- on our Facebook by answering three entrance questions. Your membership is hidden, and the admins keep the room constructive and helpful. Uh, now, can we get this elephant out of here? Nope, probably not, but we can. Deconstruct with friends. Hey, we're back. Um, Sherry, one thing I've noticed with uh, people who are deconstructing, so it, it's this weird, I think podcasting is a really good medium for it because we're kind of be able to record what's going on as it happens. And deconstruction mm. is kind of that sort of weird cultural move right now where so many of us were kind of in this tree of believing the Bible literally or fundamentalism, and then just a whole bunch of things just rammed that tree until we all fell out. And now we're like, oh, crap, where do we go? What tree do we climb up? Do we need to climb another tree? Should we knock down some trees and then use that wood to make a house? You know, that sort of that thing that we're going through. And it's so hard when it comes to God and theology because so many of us, depended and put our faith into that God. Mm-hmm. And then he wasn't answered. The, the, the prayers weren't answered. Can you kind of tell me the difference between how you define God from theology or what is God? What is theology? That sort of relationship. Well, as I said in the last set, I think that God is what man used to define the mysteries of the earth and that feeling and the miraculous nature of love. So we talk about putting things into boxes. That is, you know, putting the label of God on it. I do not, you know, and that what God is has changed so much in the last last 10,000 years that there is no consistency to that. And it's also based on laws and things that go against the nature of the universe. So technically going against God that they set up to do. So it's all of this contradictory information. Um, Jesus is another one. It really bugs me when people say that he is the only way, the truth and the life. And what about all of the millions of people before him that doesn't, it doesn't measure up to truth. 
literally the only thing that is that I found other than the basic oxygen and, and the elements, we, from the moment we're born to the moment we die, we look for love. With religion and theology, people need to tell you about God. They need to talk to you. You need to be taught. You need to have all of these things. With love, you don't. Mm. Without love, you die. Without religion, you usually live. (laughs) (laughs) I I love how you said that about how love is the thing that is consistent between, Mm -hmm. because it's something that we're able to discover and understand as, as people where I came from a Calvinistic background, well, evangelical Calvinistic. And then, well, that was, you know, the frame, but we had this idea that nothing good can come from people. And so we had to ignore how all these other cultures grew and produced and developed and evolved with these deep understandings of love that didn't make sense to us because they didn't have yeah. the gospel. And we had to kind of ignore those. And in my white, stupid brain was just able to kind of dismiss them because they looked different than me. Yeah, And I felt superior in the back of my mind that, well, the the white people, we have this religion. It has to be. <laughs> well, yeah, because Jesus is white, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the only on, white right? guy from Africa. <laughs> well, I mean, there was Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Are all oh, that's true. I mean, that's those true. sound like they're going to Harvard next yeah. semester. <laughs> but I don't know. There was um, just something about that come out. The, commonality of what we're able to experience and discover of you also said that religion has to be declared. And I remember even the, the, my Bible training comes to my mind. I think of that verse in a Bible that says, how would they know unless they are told and how would they be told unless they are sent and how would, and everything. And it comes down to when it is a faith in something that can't show for itself we're not going to be able to discover that or find it on our own because the only way to find it is when somebody tells you that story. Well, and and what does that story give you and the other people? If it, one of my big epiphanies was really seeing the 10 commandments for what they were. And I was able to see that, by reading Charles Dawkins' Ten Commandments, by reading the humanist Ten Commandments, by reading the Satanist Ten Commandments and comparing them. And in doing so, if you really do a side-by-side comparison, the the Satanic Temple's Ten Commandments are more loving then the Ten Commandments are. The Ten Commandments are about property and ownership and my God's bigger than your God. Just remember that. And all of these things, and they've they've been totally rotated and they're different in the Protestant and the Catholic and the Judaism and all of this stuff. So in and of themselves is all this inconsistency. But to overcome the fallacy that religion brings ethics was really easy to do. Far too easy. (laughs) I mean, it was, that was one of the things that was like, how did I never see this before? How did I never see this before? Earlier, you said you saw the Ten Commandments for what they were after you compared them. What do you mean by that? And how does that interact with human to human values? Well, I have this whole image because there are 613 commandments in all. And I I have this like cartoon that plays in my head where Moses is sitting at a desk and he says, love everybody. And then one by one, the people came and asked for exceptions, you know, (laughs) but, but um, so I first look at it as that way, because these are just all trying to figure out to go back to the, just don't be a dick types of things. But the first five are about an insecure God and my God is bigger than your God. And don't forget that the, the, the second five are about community, uh, property ownership, you know, is you can break down envy 
and say why envy is bad without it being a Ten Commandment. You know when you're jealous and what jealousy has done across the centuries. It doesn't have to be from God. So as a teenager, when I was as evangelical, all in, but very rebellious at the same time, um, I actually got more morality from my atheist girlfriend. And it wasn't until my mid twenties that I started to put that together going, whoa, she was always the one going, Sherry, that's not very nice. <laughs> my youth group was like that bitch. What are we going to do? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I'd go to church and get the judgment and the planning and all of vindictiveness. And I'd run home and tell my best friend and go, this is what I'm going to do. And she'd be like, holy shit, that's evil. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. So, you know, if you look at it again, don't be a dick, you know, and love to to your woman's your property, your, you know, their house is this, be nice to your parents, uh, you know, all of those types of things. And I, and I broke all of them down. They've changed. I mean, the do not take the Lord's name in vain was actually do not speak of God outside of the church. So it wasn't any type of, you know, a, a saying a cursing or anything like that. Um, so they have dramatically changed and their meanings have changed. So to put any validity and our ethics in those types of things when they've proven not to be was my first step to go, OK, I'm not doing this anymore. Hmm. You know, when, when, when the satanic temples, Ten Commandments are kinder than the Christian churches and what they follow, there's a serious problem. I want to get to the satanic church in a bit. Um, okay. There's something I've noticed about them that uh, I see in you in a good way. And, and we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Went from Jesus to the satanic church. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I hear you say, I think too, of uh, when Jesus talked, uh, Jesus in quotes, right? Or any any culture really, you know, that we're seeing it pop up, uh, the golden rule of teach, treat others the way that you want to be treated. That's just a human to human environment. And there's no special supernatural deity or anything that needs to be added into it. Exactly. It's, as you say, that energy that's being given from one human to another to do it in a way that it's not harming one another or that it is um, building that love. And so I see you saying that I'm going to use old time uh, terminology. So, so bear with me. Um, you're saying that human to human values and love is the God and the brands and the stories, the exclusivity and et cetera, that comes along with it is the idol. So mm. when it turns away from these human to human values and how we treat each other, it's actually becoming in a sense, ideology. Right? Yeah. Um, and when it becomes about like, well, no, you're not talking in the same brand or the right brand, or you're not talking about the right God, or you're not talking about, uh, or you're, you're not, you're saying something about quote God that is absolutely wrong or blah, blah, blah. Those things that kind of get in between us as seeing each other as humans. Um, yeah, I, I want to strike those down and, and get rid of those. I've noticed that a lot of times in deconstruction spaces that there's kind of an assumption that everyone's going to become maybe a progressive Christian and stay that way. I, I think that it's a helpful step. I think that it's a helpful destination for many. So I, I don't want to criticize that or to make it sound like nobody should do that. But I think what I'm hoping to say is not everybody should have to fall into that category. What are kind of some of the things that you've seen in the deconstruction community where maybe progressive Christianity assumes a specific role or destination um, and what we can kind of like learn about that and find ourselves in a different way? I think progressive Christianity definitely has its place. But I don't think it is as much on the deconstruction path as a lot of people believe. 
Because if you're truly deconstructing the religion that you once believed in, then it's more of looking on the inside. I mean, truly, you, you know, it's you dissect your religion. The progressive Christianity, in my experience, is a bigger table. They haven't shed a lot of the dogma. They haven't shed a lot of the doctrine. They definitely haven't shed any of their ego, which is the opposite of love. Um, and so now it's just, you know, look, we're more accepting. We're when not. Say, I'm sorry to interrupt. When you Go say ahead. they, though, who who do you mean by that day? Like. Well, I'm not going to name names, but the the progressive Christian leaders out there. Leaders. So you don't mean just everybody who's progressive Christian. No, no, no. I'm I'm totally just talking about the leaders. Um, you know, the people who are coming out and saying, "Well, now follow me because I am inclusive of the LGBT community," but yet they still haven't shed any of the beliefs that they once had that those people were separate and different. Uh, so it's it's a bigger table, but it's still the same dogma. It's still the same lessons. It's, you know, it, it may be more of an enlightened, okay, well, now we're not going to exclude all of these people. So a lot of these verses need to go. But in my experience, it, it still isn't a position of love. It's a position of authority. It's a position of, I know the right way now and you don't. I mean, I'm the first one to say, I don't know. And I'm okay with that. A lot of people aren't. Uh, and I don't think um, progressive Christianity is there yet. So I don't, I don't even consider them as part of a deconstruction path. It might be the door opening to um, more LGBT inclusive and those types of things. But I don't see how you could be a progressive Christian and what I consider true deconstruction of walking away from the church. And that's not necessarily God or any of that, but the bullshit dogma and stuff that they put on it. I wonder if it has to do a little bit still with that prepackaged all or nothing. Exactly. To, but done it's still a product. Way. And so I've noticed that the times I kind of try to push back or ask questions, people say, well, no, you're just, you're looking at it through your fundamentalist view or you're saying that we're, but I say, no, it, it, this is what I'm kind of questioning here of now there's even like, oh, well, I'm doubting, but I'm doubting the right ways. I'm doubting, you know, like in this, I'm doubting in this path that's still going to lead me towards Christianity at the end, or um, I'm questioning it this way. And it kind of like, in a way, even kind of puts an exclusive branding on the way that people walk away from Christianity or walk away from Christian beliefs that we grew up with or walk away from evangelicalism. Um, and it feels constrictive at times. And you know me, I'm, I, I'm a humanist who tells things through the lens of storytelling. So as you say, uh, talk about God, I, I would word it a little different, but I, we learn the same things through the same ways. And so I'm thinking of um, Star Trek that I'm a huge nerd in. And I understand like, because of the way they tell stories, the difference between a simulation appropriation and like how cultures divide and work. And so when I hear a lot of people talk about, well, well, no, now Jesus is, is open to save all of these other sort of people. To me, that doesn't sound like inclusivity. To me, that sounds like an open invitation to assimilate now underneath this other brand where I don't feel that there's much respect for the values that are being practiced, told, and done outside of their specific brand of storytelling at times in my experience. I totally agree. I got to know this progressive leader over in the UK. And at first I really respected him and thought he was different and he was progressive and he was all inclusive. And then as we got to talk more and real life and, and the LGBT community being prominent on my social media, I started getting these messages, these emails from him talking about how, well, 
you know, we invited lesbians over for dinner, even though we know they're going to hell and we don't respect their lifestyle. <laughs> it's like, so in other words, you're just a fake hypocrite. You know, you're still judging. You're just saying, well, come on over. Come on eat. I, you know, yes, I, I think that Jesus would accept all of you. I'll feed you, you know, even though you're probably going to hell. Wow. Um, I think in my personal opinion, I would rather someone tell me straight to my face they're going to hell rather than sugarcoat it and try and act like they're going to be my friend and be some type <laughs> exactly. of fake thing. Right. And I think that that's, pro- that's, that's one of the problems in progressive Christianity is that they're saying, look, we are bigger, you know, we have a bigger table, we have all of this acceptance. There's nothing that they're doing that is actually... And I'm not all inclusive. I'm generalizing here. There are people, obviously, that are making really good strides out there and helping a lot of people who to overcome religious trauma. But when you are marketing another thing by saying you left this marketing company because they were evil and you turn around and just start another marketing company under a different name, then it's still that. And, and again, I don't think that's deconstruction. That is, you know, saying I'm just going to make the table bigger doesn't wow. do much. When I think of deconstruction, I think of in the early 1900s, whenever America had to start having the Better Business Bureau for America, for America or, or whatever, there was an act. I forgot the name of the amendment or the act that had to do with false advertisement. And that had to fix all of the, like some really big issues that we had. And so what it made it do is if you're going to present a product, you have to be able to follow through with it. If it mm-hmm. says that it's going to answer your prayers, then guess what? I better have evidence or a history of answering those prayers. And if it says, oh my God, of course I'm going to answer your prayers. If you ask for us for bread and I give you a snake, I would be such an idiot, right? Yeah. Of course I'm going to answer. <laughs> and it, but it isn't able to follow through. You kick the puppy so many times it feels like it's a fault. You keep kicking it and eventually it's going to bite you back. And yeah. so what I think of deconstruction is kind of what we went through in America at that time in other places in the world where this has popped up, where we had to be more aware of the relationship between um, the, the salesman, the advertising department and the legal department um, who are, have to be responsible of backing up what's being said. And to me with Christianity, that's evangel evangelist and then apologist and we know those two are not saying the same thing. It's like yeah. one is God can do everything. The other one's like, oh, okay, let me explain why he does. <laughs> <Right? And so, laughs> what I think becomes hard is when we go from fundamentalism to um, outside of it or, or get bigger with our beliefs and our understanding of God or, or even Jesus or whatever our listeners might be going through, they're opening their eyes to more ideas. And I think that's a great, great thing. Um, for me, when I think of deconstruction, I I think more of, I think of it from the consumer's point of view and not from how do we improve our product so that less people complain about it, which I think is what a lot of uh, progressive Christian influences. That's kind of what we're used to. That's kind of our our, our modus operandi is, uh, well, we need to improve this product instead of question back and saying, is it actually following through with what it says that it's going to do? Yeah. And God becomes this confusing theme for people who are coming out of, of fundamentalism because when we're talking to people with a more liberal view, they'll say, well, no, God is this metaphor. It was a storytelling technique. It's how the cultures did this. It's how they did that, blah, blah, blah. But we're also working from the framework of knowing what it promises and what it says that it will distinctively do. So if we're talking about a metaphor that's cute, but we also have this part where it promises that it's going to make a distinctive supernatural difference in our life. And then you get, like when you fundamentalists, like ex fundamentalists, we start asking questions. It's always this kind of like patting us on the head and being like, oh no, honey. No, <laughs> Bless your heart. It's not, to be, it's not to be taken literal. But then I start asking questions and find out, well, no, you're taking it literal too, just different parts yeah. and kind of doing it with a condescending attitude at the same time. So if we want to do that, let's sit down and talk about 
what parts am I cool and okay and groovy if I take literal? And what parts am I, a, you know, just a fucking idiot gay guy who repressed himself for 14 years for a God who's totally fine with gay people. And I should have done yeah. that the whole time. Right. <laughs> well, and, and that's what I mean by there's little change, you know, it, it seems to be, uh, you know, all encompassing and all accepting until you get down to, you know, it's, it, it is a marketing change up. It is a, just a, a redesign um, saying that we do this and we're accepting, but you haven't shed those beliefs. If you have, you know, you, oh, well, okay, well, I still don't believe this, but I believe this and this. It's, it's still picking and choosing. And how is that going to make me a better person? You still haven't told me how I'm going to be a better person. And, and that's what it really came down to for me. My mom was literally on her deathbed. It was two or three days before she passed. And she was overcome with fear. I could see it on her face. She grabbed my arm and with tears in her eyes, this, the strongest woman I had ever known broke. And she said, what if I got it all wrong? What if I prayed to the wrong God? Oof. And my heart just broke for her. I knew she was in the last hours of her life. And I said, mom, you know, you tried, you tried really hard and that's what should matter. Mm. She a, almost a year to the day that she died, she had an epiphany and realized that she was trying to control me and that she used religion to do it. And she apologized for all of that in her past. So I openly forgave her for all of that, but I also wanted to learn from it. So I took that example and said, you know what, no matter what I do, if I'm on my deathbed, I don't want to grab my son's arm and say, did I do it right? Did I believe the right thing? Because if it's all just down to beliefs, I don't want any part of this. I want someone to act. And I want to know that at the end of my life, that I did the most I could to put smiles on faces, warm people's hearts, hug them and make this planet, which I'm not too fond of to begin with, <laughs> a little bit better of a place for yes. all of us, regardless of what people believe. God, I love that. I'm really sorry about your mom. What is it that kind of caused her? What, what have that change of heart? She, um, and there's a lot of books on death, uh, but supposedly uh, there's a book called Embracing the Light and she calls them the monks. Uh, Mike Zenker, who does a lot of, of work with the dying, um, calls them something else. But she had had a lot of visitations from people who weren't there. I watched her talk to people in a chair who weren't there. Um, there was a lot of delirium. And then there was, um, then she would become fine. And we would talk about it. We would laugh about it. You know, she said some crazy shit. Like she looked at me one time and said, are you still chasing pink elephants in the sea? <laughs> <laughs> okay, mom, the drugs yes. are kicking good. Um, but so I don't know what was going on in her head. I think she realized that she had days left and just the absolute fear of dying. Mm. You know, she had tried to do this. She had given up her daughter, you know, to try and live right. And then now she's on her deathbed and she's wondering, did I even do the right thing? Wow. That's so powerful. There's one thing that really changed this for me, um, and that was learning about the Egyptian funerary beliefs of the scales and believing that, you know, they you they weighed your heart. And if it was light as a feather, then you would go to their heaven. And if it was, you know, not, you'd go to their hell. And that changed everything for me, because then it went from this. Oh, my God, you sinned. You're going to hell. I'm ruined. I always lived with so much shame as a Christian, so much fear. And then when I learned about the, these scales, I was like, now that's that to me that, you know, especially with with scales, it's justice. So, if you know, as long as I'm alive, I can still be a better person. I can still do things better for this analogy of the scales of life and, and use my own scales as, as that judgment. I love that. That is beautiful. I'm thinking it doesn't require of, perfection or beliefs. It's just the, are you at peace with yourself? Are you 
have you done what you need to do? I love that. I love that. Another thing that I've noticed that deconstructioner, deconstructioners are experiencing, especially with our listeners, we deal a lot with like spiritual abuse and religious trauma. Mm-hmm. And I think about myself as well, with like the, um, just the context that I have of like growing up gay and knowing that I had to repress it. And I did it for God and, and, and out of dedication to him and to praying constantly. And I think of the other people who have experienced spiritual abuse that maybe they were being abused by a family member or pastors or whatever. And I know that each one of us, we were so in the faith that we just prayed and we, had so much faith in God to help us. But when we experienced it, we had no response. There was no version of God that, you know, the 14 years that I repressed my sexuality, no version of God answered my prayers and said, Hey Brady, I've noticed that uh, you've been freaking out about this. Um, It's going to be okay. You know? And so a lot of people who are deconstructing are coming out of these experiences of taking God as a very literal um, prayer answerable, whatever. Um, But then we're kind of hitting into deconstruction of, okay, where, what is my belief? What is my experience? What is my like underseen of, of history? De- right. Taking each one of those things that used to be prepackaged and kind of taking them apart. What would you, as somebody who has a understanding of God that doesn't harm, what would you personally say to somebody who kind of put that much energy, so much of their life and experience into something that didn't give back. And now we're saying, am I even worth being responded to? Or God, I, I misunderstood prayer. Is it their fault? No, I've been there. I I've been there. I um, vividly remember being on the floor with my head on the pew sobbing because my dad was going to hell. My best friend was going to hell begging, begging. Uh, I prayed every night. And you know, if, if this God that they told me about did answer prayers, I never saw it. I never saw it. What I did see is, um, for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. It's not, so my, when my, I'm sorry, my head's going a million miles an hour because I got 5 million things to say. <laughs> <laughs> when when my, mom, my mom died, five years afterwards, I was going through her diaries and it was her prayer diaries. So I got to read all of her prayers and going through and it was, Oh, Jesus, thank you for, you know, keeping me strong and not letting me sleep with my boyfriend and those types of odd things. Um, But what I found truly disturbing was she was praying for so many material things and judgmental things. Like she would pray, um, you know, God, I went to this Bible study at so-and-so's house. Please make sure they clean their house or I can't go back. You know, their house was just too messy for this Bible study. Please make them cleaner. Um, <laughs> the other one was, you know, I need a new VCR. I would like the model JBC and then why she put the model numbers down. Are you sending this on her Amazon wish list before? What the hell? I love it. Yeah, I mean, it was, and I just was like, I was horrified, you know, like thinking, A, that God, had, you know, cares about these types of things. How, you know, how's a VCR going to make this planet better in any way? Um, and also using God to justify her judgment of these people who, you know, she felt that, you know, the, the houses weren't as clean. In all of my experiences, I've only had um, one type of prayer answered. And that is what? What am I to do? What am I to pray? Um, Never anything else has even come close to being answered. 
Uh, and I think that that is a getting into the flow. All of my, my degree is in comparative religion. So I studied all of the major religions and I could easily break them down to only two things, which was love and let go. And Christianity, you know, after you take all the dogma and tribal beliefs and everything away, that that's what those, that those are the only two things that stand. Christianity takes that as a surrender and submission and that type of thing. Um, the Eastern religions look at it as, as a you know, lack of attachment. Um, New Ages say it's, you know, I'm going to be in the flow. You know, it's them going into the universal flow. They all have their ways of saying this. Um, you know, Newton says for every action, there's an opposite and we get reaction, karma, all of these things. So in loving and letting go, I take my ego out of the situation, which has taken a lot of uh, bad turns away from me, where things that I would have said, I want this and I'm doing this no matter what. I've avoided a lot of heartache. I've avoided, avoided a lot of pain from no longer doing that. Um, I don't think that there is someone up there and I'm a marionette. I think I am jumping into the universal flow of life that is creative, um, that is prosperous as far as life, not financially or materially. Uh, you know, the, the true nature of things. And in fact, that reminds me, I want to say one thing I disagree with you on. I do not limit this flow to human to human. I think that there are animals that are greater than us on this planet. And oh, hell yeah. Yes. <laughs> I just wanted me, to clarify that. <laughs> I, I use human in a very like Star Trekian way. Yeah. Because like, they, yeah. they say humans and they literally have um, like sentient dolphin officers on board mm. at the Star Trek. Enterprise. That's right. I forgot like, about that episode. And, and yes. going to like, you know, we've got like dolphins and then the whales and voyage home. And then you've got <laughs> every other like Vulcan and, and Delorean, like, you know, it's all these different species, but they all mean human because that's, it was a, it was a, it, yes, no, I'm totally with you on that. <laughs> and we should know you're wearing a Star Trek t-shirt and I'm wearing a Bazinga t-shirt. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, it, I love that you brought up animals because that's literally the segue that I wanted to go into is uh, spiritually, I I feel a connection with my cat. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but nope. part of it was for me to learn how cats communicate. And there's a slow blink eye contact that's made. And when I understood that and was able to speak his language, um, we understood each other. And he's been with me for... You know, by divorce, raising my kid, everything, and has always been kind of like a constant energy for me. And whenever I introduced a new cat into the mix, I, I, I empathized with them so much as I could. And I tried to put myself in their shoes of what is this like to be in this world of giants? And now they're being introduced to another one who looks just like them, but different colors they didn't know existed. All these different things. I, I, and I understood them, but that was because I was able to put myself in their perspective. Mm. And you mentioned something earlier too, when it came to evolution. And what I see evolution is man's ability to, um, instead of just listening to whatever story was handed to them, to be able to zoom out objectively and look at, at the, the appropriate perspective and say, oh, when you look at it from here, from this high up, it isn't just this these small little cultural stories that popped up in different places. But when we look at all of them, we look at the evidence we have, we look at uh, fossils, we look at the animals, it actually tells this other story. And it tells the story of these things changing over time. And when I look at it as a fundamentalist Christian, it's, well, no, it's only been 6,000 years. Mm. And then it made this, and then God did this, and then there was the uh, Adam. And, or, but if you look at it from there, you say, oh my God, we are all connected biologically, but also environmentally. And we've all been evolving among each other, alongside of each other, we've been kind of creating this awareness among each other. And that sort of ability to look at it objectively helped me reframe 
how I look at the world and th- theology, right? They say theology is, a, is, is how a story, how a culture tells their stories. And then God is a metaphor of those things, whatever. But when I looked at objectively, um, teaching like Joseph Campbell, et cetera, they gave me the ability to kind of, instead of looking at supernatural beliefs that I grew up with, I'm going to zoom out and I'm going to look at them as evolution objectively. I'm going to look at them and say, oh, this is where they kind of started. And then they evolved to this. And then they were kind of alongside this other fundamentalist religion that they had to fight, uh, but they're over the same places. And so they involved in the same space. And that's why if you're born in one part of the world, you're most likely going to believe that this X thing is God. And if you're born in this other place, you're going to think that this other X thing is God. So when it makes sense to zoom out. And so let me, let me keep you out there. Let's say we're a hundred miles above earth and all we see. If you are truly objective, we are just egotistical ants. <laughs> I love it. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we are ants with egos saying we're the best here and, you know, totally negating everything else. And to even think that we as ants with giant egos to say, you know, at this hundred foot that God loves just them. You know, just this little set of ants right here that has their little spot in the planet. They God just loves me. Nothing else, you know, we are supposed to control the world. We are supposed to reign over everything in the world. When in all reality, if we are objective and expansive, we are just egotistical ants at this point. Um, We can either make the world a better place. We can increase the forest. We can do all of these things to make the planet. Because at this point, ants are less destructive than humanity is. You know, at least ants are serving their area and and keep perpetuating their nature. Um, But because we're egotistical ants, we're ruining everything in the process. And then we're blaming God for it. Or the devil. (laughs) Yes. I'm going to be greedy and ask you for a little bit of advice for our listeners then. When we grew up in fundamentalism, the only cultural storytelling that we are used to is this prepackaged evangelicalism. Everything was Jesus copyrighted, Jesus copyrighted, Jesus copyrighted, right? Like everything was so on that exclusive brand. As we're deconstructing and we're trying to figure out human values and how we interact with the world, do you have any practical advice of how to kind of transfer from that one frame of exclusive storytelling to a more bigger, broader global view that encapsulates all of us? I think a lot of it is deconstructing the identity that you had in those stories, because the identity that you hold on to is the, going to remain a part that remains a part that is still needed for deconstruction. The identity has to be broken because the identity is in beliefs. And when your identity is in beliefs, it is fragile. It is um, collapsible. It is offended. All of these things that things that we know um, don't incur. So when you're going through the deconstruction process, you have to realize what your identity was in those beliefs and then what your identity is in deconstructing those beliefs, deconstructing those beliefs from a judgment, um, clicky environment to an accepting, loving environment. Again, not what the Bible says, not what my pastor says, but what does my brother need? What does my neighbor need? What does this person I don't even like need, but they still needy? What can I do for that? That is true love. And that's um, something that's really, really hard to do as humans. <laughs> that's, that's such a good point. I think about if theology and if God is a storytelling technique of where we are at a time, um, I'm thinking about, I'm always thinking about the queer perspective Um, as, as a gay man. And when I ask from my experience, when I've asked queer theologians about, well, what do you say to a queer person who repressed themselves or to a spiritual abuse victim who like dedicated themselves and, and did everything, but God never said anything back. What do you say to them? And 
I just don't get an answer back. And that what that makes me think is that there is no answer um, because they're coming from a place of wanting to defend their idea of, of like a God who's able to interact and who, you know, makes decisions on his own. Um, and because it's not a convenient question, it's easily ignored. Mm -hmm. And from my experience as a queer person who like, I put myself through therapy to like fix myself and other people who've gone through like conversion therapy and overnight camps and everything like that. Um, if you have to exclude us from the storytelling, the queer storytelling, then it's not really queer theology. Um, to me, it's just the same as before of ignoring the inconvenient people who don't, whose lives and experiences don't go along with what we're trying to sell and what we're trying to say would happen if you were in that position. Well, yeah, I mean, and that and that's where it's selective and that's where it's still ego based. It's still a division. It's still saying, well, God likes me better and, and all of these things. Um, as long as there's division it, and in the name of God, it, that's going to happen. Um, the ego is there. And if you use God to further your agenda, I, in doing my research, I came across this guy. I was trying to figure out beyond the Bible, get some true definitions of love. I can't stand Paul. I think he corrupted everything. And, um, Reach. Oh, but I, I still take a lot of value and lessons in Chris, Corinthians 13. Um, there are people and Buddhists, you know, Islam, Muslims, where, how do people define love? And I came across this one blog where this guy said, love is the worst thing on the planet. It sucks the life out of you. You know, stay oh, away from my, it. You found my blog? You found my blog? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, he was describing love as the literally worst thing on this planet. And I was kind of horrified. And also, you know, I, I had to laugh. Um, but also really sympathize because that was coming from a point of trauma. So if you are talking to someone and you're saying, you know, well, who hurt you? And they're unable to differentiate a theological abuse from the trauma that was incurred by man saying that love is, is you know, God is love is going to reject that love. So you need a lot of deconstruction into where to put the blame. And in my opinion, you can't blame energy. All of the blame is on us. Now, if there's a being, if there's some dude in the sky, the two dudes in the sky, well, then, yeah, you can blame them. But when there's nothing to blame, it goes back to man. And then and I think that's what a lot of religious leaders are afraid of. Don't look at me. I'm just doing what God told me to do, which is bullshit. You know, they're doing what they want to do. It's, I think of that like in the time where like, um, and I know this story is up for debate, but when Jesus uh, interceded with where they were going to stone the woman who was caught into adultery and Jesus came in and was like, oh, don't do it. But I'm also like, okay, but if you're the Trinity, you also kind of are the reason that they're doing it at the same time. <laughs> like, let's not pretend that you didn't command them to do that. You know, and then there's like the, oh, what well, might have been a different? It, it's true. Yes, I get like, and their their intentions were wrong. But I think of it like in the same way of when it comes to fundamentalists who believe the Bible literally. I mean, we can think that they're they're fucking idiots, or we can say, oh, they are kind of. Fu they're doing yeah, they're taking it literal like shit like, and so there is like. I like what you said about passing the blame and especially about if there is somebody in the sky that they're responsible as a gay guy, I'm thinking if God knew that his words are going to be so misinterpreted, the motherfucker would have done better at communicating and he would have shown his allyship to the queer community by um, sending a new prophet who can do miracles and we know that it's him and it's everything's cool or like he could pray or uh, answer our prayers or whatever. If there was somebody there, an autonomous being, a deity, 
um, that had the ability to stop evil and just sat there and watched it instead. He's not much like you who said earlier that your goal in life is to do as much good with the power that you have as you can while you're here. If he sat and watched a whole bunch of queer people repress themselves because they wanted to obey him and honor and glorify him, and he was just sitting there like, oh, they misunderstood me, but I'm not going to interrupt them. That's not a loving thing to do. No, but but keep in mind, um, in making Jesus divine, he made him also very um, bipolar. Because like you said, you know, how can you be the son of God and be here to enforce those laws, but then say, no, you're exempt. I mean, it really, there's no consistency with Jesus being divine. There's no consistency whatsoever. Um, You break all of the dogmatic laws and try and justify them out. There are a lot of scholars who assert that Jesus had to have been married or gay. Uh, most of the things in the Bible, as far as homosexual prohibition, were actually be about pederasty and pedophilia, not about homosexuality. Homosexuality was um, not a sin back then. It was widely accepted. For Jesus to be single as the Christian church has constructed him, he would have been labeled a pariah. He would have been a madman. Um, No one would have been talking to a person who couldn't even find a life partner to be with. So there had to have been someone else. There was actually more proof that Jesus was gay than it was that he was married, um, other than the superficial of being followed by 12 guys (laughs) all around everywhere. (laughs) I wouldn't know anything about that. Yeah, but, you know, there's there's. When you add the divinity contradiction, you add all of those things in and you take away from the value, like you said, of the accepting, of the loving. If you could possibly imagine Jesus being gay and reading the Beatitudes or looking at the stoning story and saying, or the centurion story, all of a sudden it doesn't need to be said. But because man came in and made him a sterile a uh, very monotone, boring person who just walked around barefoot in this white shirt, you know, white long robe, um, who was single and, and didn't go to the bathroom. And I mean, one of the things I said, I and saw, was, yeah, Jesus farted. And that about, I was like, oh, you're right. He could, he had to have, he had, and that in itself, you know, it was like, okay, let's take Jesus off of this pedestal that we have put him on and blamed everybody for this. And instead, look at him as a teacher. You would never look at your instructor in your college and go, well, you don't know this or you didn't talk about this. It's never going to be all encompassing, but you can look at them as a teacher and you can say, "Okay, well, here's a possibility for this and here's a possibility for this. But none of that fucking matters if it's not about love. None of that. God, I love you. I love you, too, Brady. Before we close, I want to play a quick game with you. Okay. I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios that if you were God, what would you do? And then we are going to end on a special lightning round. Okay. All right. Number one, if you were God for a day, what is the first thing that you would do? I mean, like God, God. Yeah. Um, I think, I think I would, I think I, if I was on earth, the first thing I would uh, be underwater playing with the dolphins and the whales and yes. talking to them and their giant brains and probably talking shit about all the humans on, on the dry land. <laughs> I love that. Number one, you are like aqua woman queen. And I love it. Um, you, you go straight to the ocean. Um, <laughs> and I could see you being in the justice league. Like you're, you're That's like hilarious. A, you're, you could be like a, a wonder woman cosplaying as Aquaman. There you go. I, in my next life, I hope to be a, a marine mammal. Are you familiar with Star Trek, like four yes. of the fourth movie? Yes. The one with the whales. I just, what a weird movie, but I love it. <laughs> <laughs> 
And it's like how the mom from Seventh Heaven became a thing and ended up on like yeah. she was a marine biologist in that movie and she was darling. I love that one. So good. Hilarious. Um okay, number two. If you could rewrite any Bible story, what would you rewrite and what would you do? How would you change it? It's a toss-up between no, it's not a toss up enough upon further thought. Um, the the stoning of the woman. I, I I would have had Jesus be far more of a champion. I would have had Jesus expound on what he was saying. Um, I would have criticized the leaders more, shunned them more, um, given more power to her because they're you know especially um, back then women were. Just, I mean, they were abused for just being women. They had to be isolated during menstruation. They were, you know, penalized and were killing a shit ton of birds because of it. It was ridiculous. But I would definitely, um, I don't know, a side of me goes, well, they would have fucked it up and changed it anyway. So it doesn't matter what you say. <laughs> you <know>? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, right. You could have all the good intentions in the world and you could have done this and someone would have come along and said, no, you know, the patriarchy rules, shut up, woman. So, you know, <laughs> so there's always that little thing in the back of my head as I'm saying this. I, I think uh, for me, and I'm just spitballing here, I would probably change Noah's Ark. I think that would have been cool if oh, that's a big the problem. animals kicked the humans off the Ark let Noah's family die. And then just eventually we kind of like evolved into a zootopia. There you go. Situation that That's Eden. Humanoid. Yeah. The humanoid like animals. I'm into it. I have such a problem with Noah's Ark because now I see people drowning and banging on the sides of the Ark and trying to hold up their children to say oh, God. Right. You know, I, yeah. I see, I see it as such a tragedy and, and to have it glorified for most of my life is just, really what disturbing. a fucked up what a fucked up dude like yeah i just here's what i wish i wish god and satan would just get couples therapy <laughs> oh my god work out your shit and people <laughs> in on it am i right well like, again it comes back on us it's all what we need to do um, and finally, I want I want to end on a lightning round. And what this is, is we are going to say blasphemous jokes to see if either one of us gets struck by lightning. OK. OK. <laughs> First one. By the way, um, I am having a lightning storm outside, so this could be really oh, hilarious. <laughs> <my God. laughs> this is intense. The um, test. Um, do you do you have any blasphemous jokes? I have one. It's more of a visual, but I think I can. I think I can narrate it. Jesus is on the ground on the cross. The Roman soldiers are surrounding him, and Peter walks in and goes, "Stop!" And the Roman soldiers go, "Hammer time!" <laughs> <laughs> I. <I'm dead. laughs> Uh, I have an, I have a one that's kind of a visual as well. Do you know why Jesus was so popular over women and gay men? Because he was hung like this. <laughs> um, do you know what the difference between a between Jesus and a picture of Jesus is? What? It only takes one hammer and nail to hang a picture. <laughs> And then the last one is, um, you know how they say when you die, you become more like God or you come mm -hmm. closer to God. Yeah, that's because you don't exist anymore. Oh, boo, boo. <laughs> um, Sherry, I want to thank you so much for sharing your story and just sharing your thoughts with us because, God, I know that deconstructing is such a difficult Thing for our listeners to navigate through when it comes to these beliefs that we were grown up with, that we brought up with, and the only ones that we had been exposed to. And here we are in this 
<laughs> we're an animal who just got dropped off at a new house with new cats and new environments. And you're like, oh God, how do I adapt now to this world that is so much different than the one that I was used to? And I feel that you really helped us understand how to take the best of both worlds of the ones that we can see and the ones that we we want. And you've done a great job of explaining to even deconstructors how we can hold on to those ideas and work towards become better humans. If it doesn't make it better, it's not worth it. And if it's not making us love more, it's not better. No, I mean, I mean, g- give us a reason to worship you, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. The, the church doesn't give us many reasons. I agree. Thank you so much. Thank you. I had and, so much fun. And I appreciate the times I'd be able to be on your show. Can you kind of, um, why don't you promote yourself and your work a little bit? I have a live stream weekly that airs Tuesday at 7 p.m. called Fireside Creators where I gather uh, experts, scholars, and people with interesting stories to discuss beliefs. And you can find me at sherrypalace.com. That is palace like Dallas, but with a P. (laughs) I'm going to name this episode Sherry Does Palace. Is that... I love and appreciate you and your energy and your love and your willingness to break down so many fucking walls and to really just make loving humans, loving humans, the center. And I appreciate the hell out of you. Thank you so much. The feelings mutual, Brady. Thank you for listening, listener. And remember, if you don't go to church, Sunday is just a second Saturday. This has been an episode of the Life After podcast. Find us on Facebook for our secret online community. Find our merch on TeePublic, monthly contributions on Patreon, and don't forget to rate and review the show on iTunes. Congratulations, you played yourself out of mental health and living in self. Speak for yourself, your marriage not a testimony. Don't believe the church is a bribe, but she owe me alimony. I'm a pony up and stick a feather in your ceremony. Wearing weddings out, I call it Yankee Doodle matrimony. And I'm only getting started, my tongue is fire. Fighting gaslighting leaders like your ways are not higher. I don't need a choir to bring down the entire empire. You threw the gasoline, I'm just spitting matches through the wire. Trying to break them free, make them see the refrains and mental chains of slavery. I disagree with any preacher, teacher, not on defeat. I repeat, I don't need a church to walk in victory. I'm complete. And everybody sings, and everybody sings. Please, pull some strings for me. And everybody sings, and everybody sings. Go, 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 go.